We are talking about stream flow generation mechanisms. In other words, how does water that falls on the landscape of a watershed, how does it actually get to the stream? And today we are going to focus on subsurface storm flow. So as the name implies, this is water that is able to infiltrate into the ground and then moves through the subsurface to the stream. Another term that you may have heard for this phenomenon is interflow. An interflow is used to um, indicate that it is something that isn't quite our normal groundwater flow, uh, but is occurring in the subsurface. So subsurface storm flow is really important around here in places like Ohio and much of the eastern U.S. that are temperate and humid, uh, naturally forested. In these places, our rain intensity is generally relatively low, and the infiltration capacity of our soils is often sufficient to infiltrate all of the water uh, that comes from the sky, makes through the canopy as through fall, um, and reaches the ground. So we don't tend to have a lot of infiltration excess over land flow in forested areas in the eastern U.S. Instead, our real um, big flow generation mechanism is subsurface storm flow. So how does it work? So uh, soil texture influences the ability of the water to infiltrate moisture, uh, but uh, Bulk soil texture is important, but macropores and preferential flow paths within the soil are even more important. So these are things like cracks, tree roots, animal burrows uh, that are bringing water very rapidly into the deeper part of the subsurface. So it's not just the wetting front moving downwards uniformly, but you have these sort of super highways into the subsurface rapidly bringing water into the subsurface. Um, you can also have lateral preferential flow paths. Um, a lot of times these develop around the soil bedrock interface. So these are, again, areas that water is able to kind of be more channelized, moving faster, even though it's in the subsurface. And they can be both vertical or lateral downslope the, um, through the soil. Uh, these preferential flow paths do tend to occur more near the soil surface as well as at the bedrock interface. And in general, if we move down into a soil, you'll see a increase in bulk density and a decrease in hydraulic conductivity. So this is some uh, classic data from a hill slope in Western Oregon, where measurements of hydraulic conductivity were made at several depths in the hill slope. And what we see here is an exponential decline in hydraulic conductivity with depth as we move into the subsurface. And this is really classic um, and pretty commonly reported in forested landscapes all over the world. And of course, in some places, we might have bedrock not that far below the land surface. But even where we just have what we'd like to think of as fairly uniform soils as we move down, this decline in hydraulic conductivity means that water that's moving vertically into the subsurface finds it harder and harder to keep moving vertically. And instead, it's forced to move laterally or downslope. So we get something that looks sort of like this. We have precipitation falling at the land surface, infiltrating into the soil. It can't keep moving vertically forever, maybe because of a bedrock interface or maybe because of this decrease in hydraulic conductivity. So instead, it starts to move downslope. And as precipitation continues, uh, this raises the, the water level uh, we get sort of a saturated wedge developing on top of our low hydraulic conductivity interface. Um, and this is then the development of subsurface storm flow. And of course, the longer um, and the more rainfall that occurs, the more this saturated wedge can build up. So we can look at this kind of um, in schematic view, several time slices. So at the top here in panel A, we have our hill slope that is draining from some rainstorms in the past. This is before um, a rainstorm begins. Any moisture in excess of field capacity is going to drain vertically and then move down the hill slope resulting in these equipotential contours here of matrix potential as shown. Um, then 
When rainfall begins, you've got the vertical infiltration and percolation of rain, the development of a wetting front near the surface. This distorts those equipotential contours because you still have drainage along um, that low hydraulic conductivity interface. As water that has infiltrated into the syrup surface gets deeper, maybe with the help of preferential flow paths and macropores, it reaches this low hydraulic conductivity interface, begins to move laterally, and the saturated wedge builds up. And the longer the rainstorm occurs, the bigger the saturated wedge gets. Um, and then when the rainstorm is over, that saturated wedge continues to drain out and feed the stream that's sort of not shown here at the base of the hill slope. So this wedge often develops, as I said, at a soil bedrock interface. It may be part of uh, the regional water table. So what you may see is the water table rises very rapidly and transiently in response to uh, rainfall inputs and that's what's illustrated here so we have groundwater and you could think of this as sort of increasing in um, in elevation or head over the storm and then falling at the end of the storm and feeding into the stream however sometimes uh, and and quite commonly the wedge can be purchased perched or that's above or separate from the regional water table. So here that's illustrated in this drawing. So we could think of horizon one maybe as the soil and horizon two as the underlying parent material. So down here you have your sort of groundwater flow happening. Um, but up here you get this transient zone of saturation that is perched relative to the regional water table. So now we have two sort of separate flow systems feeding into the stream, which is a little bit different than the last picture. So just to summarize, subsurface storm flow, sometimes called interflow, occurs where we get hydraulic conductivity decreasing with depth, which is incredibly common in many landscapes. This decrease in hydraulic conductivity forces water to move downslope laterally and develops a transient saturated wedge that then is uh, released into the stream during storm flow and for some period of time um, after the end of rainfall. So how do we know all this? Uh, we poke a lot of holes into the ground, measuring soil moisture, matrix potential, water tables, things like that, and their responses over time. And then sometimes we're even able to do full hill slope experiments and cut a, a trench or a face at the end of the hill slope and then actually collect the water that is coming out of the base of the hill slope so that we can get a really detailed spatial and temporal picture of these um, subsurface storm flow flow paths.